president's key economic team goes to China. Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. <laughs> Everyone, welcome to Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. We are a new weekly podcast focused on bringing you the most relevant, interesting, and buzzworthy headlines in China tech. We are part of PanDaily.com, a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Let me introduce myself again for those of you who are just tuning in. I am one of your two co-hosts, Ray Ma, and I live in San Francisco. I'm an angel investor, entrepreneur, China watcher, and I still can't get over how British pop star Jessie J won this season's singer, which is basically like The Voice or American Idol and this huge phenomenon in China. Seriously, that was a real breakthrough. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Yingying Liu. I'm also an entrepreneur and a China watcher. We'd like to give a shout out here to some of you who've been so kind to write in and help spread the word. Thank you to Lexi Zhang, Omen Shabani, David Rafanon, Anirin Kishan, and Armand Zond. Keep the feedback coming. Okay, so it was a really big week in China tech. Really big. Our first story is the upcoming initial public offering of Xiaomi, a Chinese smartphone and consumer electronics maker that was the fifth largest last year in terms of shipment volume. The second is the spinout of Baidu's financial services arm. Thanks, Xingying. So we're going to talk about the Xiaomi story now. Although I have to correct you here on calling Xiaomi a smartphone maker, I think Lei Jun, the founder, would most definitely kill you for saying that. He's basically been saying for the past eight years since Xiaomi's founding that it is not a hardware company, but an internet company with hardware, smartphones, IoT, etc. as its engine of innovation. And、to be fair, it did have like one and a half billion dollars or so, almost ten percent of its revenues from services last year. So, hint, hint. Unless you're named after a fruit, hardware businesses have low multiples, sometimes much lower than software businesses. That's probably why he's calling it an internet business. Anyway, back to the Xiaomi IPO. It is not just big; it is biggest. Rumors of its going public has been swirling since the beginning of this year, and depending on whether or not you're a Mi fan or a Xiaomi fan, guesses as to its eventual pricing have ranged from 50 to 200 billion dollars. But since its 597-page prospectus came out on Thursday morning Asia time, there's been a steady stream of coverage on what's shaping up to be the biggest IPO since Alibaba. Most experts think it'll be targeting a 10 billion dollar offering and maybe a 100 billion dollar pricing. That's a lot of zeros there. Yeah, Ray, I read that. So it's kind of crazy because, as you said, the company is just barely eight years old, right? I mean, I remember living in China back in 2012 and hearing about this hip new brand that only sold phones online at rock bottom prices. But they made it really hard to get one. They made you jump through all sorts of hoops, like you needed to have VIP status in their fan forums to even be eligible to put in a pre-order. Seriously, it was way harder than getting Burning Man tickets. Anyway, I never did that as I am a lazy Guo fan. That's Chinese, by the way, for Apple fan. But it was a total phenomenon when they did do that. At airports, you would see shelves of business books about this kind of 饥饿营销 or scarcity marketing. Oh, I totally remember that time. Xiaomi and Lei Jun were everywhere. He was called China's Steve Jobs. It wasn't just because he was also selling smartphones. It was also because he was really good at marketing. Xiaomi product announcements were just as highly anticipated as Apple, and didn't Lei Jun wear black turtlenecks too? Yeah, that's right. Lei Jun's nickname in China is actually Lei Bu Si. That's because in Chinese, Jobs is Qiao Bu Si, Qiao Bu Si, Lei Bu Si. Do you get it? Anyway, Lei Jun, just like Jack Ma, is a marketing genius. It's just that his English is bad, so we don't hear much from him in Western media, unlike Jack, who was an English teacher. But Lei Jun is a really good storyteller. Very humble, very grassroots, and very charming in a kind of dorky way. He's super quotable and has a lot of aphorisms that have really redefined how Chinese people think about entrepreneurship. Such as one about how if you find the right opportunity, even pigs can fly. Hmm. I guess that one actually translates into English pretty well. I don't know if he intended that. Anyway, 
I had the great luck to sit down with him about a year ago and pitch a business idea and found him just really easygoing, but also super sharp. And because Lei Jun embodies the Xiaomi brand so much, the entire company exudes those same qualities, humility, focus, and intelligence. All great qualities for a company. And I know that Xiaomi's corporate slogan is 感动人心，价格厚道 which translates into make products that touch our users' hearts at a generous, aka cheap, price. I've not met Lei Jun, but I've seen Ali Li, the co-founder, who's headed up a lot of design and e-commerce projects within Xiaomi. He's quite a reflective and deeply thoughtful, really down-to-earth person. Yeah, that's right. Those are indeed Xiaomi's values. So Lei Jun and his co-founders have built the company around value, which he defines as superior functionality, design, and experience at low prices, extremely low prices. In fact, he just announced that Xiaomi will never make more than five percent net profit margin on any of its hardware, ever. And it looks like he's making good on it. Their phones range from one to four hundred dollars, and experts estimate that the net profit per phone may be as low as two dollars. Two dollars compared to over one hundred fifty dollars for iPhones. Okay, maybe that's a bad comparison because Apple is a ripoff. But even other Chinese smartphone manufacturers have ten percent margins. Okay, maybe I should look into Xiaomi phones again once they're set up for U.S. customers. But I get that it's great for consumers. But why are investors buying into this vision, or are they? You bring up a good point, and that's definitely what Xiaomi usually gets hammered for in the press. And while they recorded profits for a few years operating on those razor-thin margins, they weren't very high. And in 2016, in particular, was a bad year when they actually suffered a decline in revenue. In fact, Lei Jun has proudly said that they were the only phone manufacturer to reverse a drop in sales. That's looking at you, Motorola, Nokia, BlackBerry, etc. Anyway, Xiaomi grew almost 70% to 18 billion dollars of revenue last year. But then, they also lost a lot of money last year, like a lot of money, seven billion dollars or so. Seven billion? Is that why they're rushing to go IPO? Maybe. I don't know. Although it did have operating profits of almost two billion dollars, so their situation isn't that dire. But it is true that some analysts think maybe the industry is going to slow down because global smartphone shipments declined for the first time this year. So maybe it's a good time to go to market with some big momentum behind it. Just so you know, Xiaomi shipped 92 million smartphones last year and really dominated in India, where it was about 31 percent of shipments last quarter. Yep, it was number one in India, edging out Samsung. We also know that it has aggressively expanded outside of phones really early on, and now sells a whole suite of consumer products in a revenue-sharing scheme with smaller startups. These smaller companies make anything from air purifiers to home camera systems, VR headsets, electric scooters. By the way, some of those scooters on the streets of San Francisco—they're from Xiaomi. Anyways, while the products differ, the designs are all really modern and minimalist, and the price is always cheap. Yeah, I haven't tried those scooters yet because I'm more of a bike girl. But I do have a e camera at home, and it's great. Xiaomi typically invests and owns a substantial stake in these companies, and now have over 100 in its portfolio. At least four of them are unicorns, and one of them even listed on the NYSE in February this year in its own IPO. We know that last year, about three billion dollars of revenues were generated from these products. Okay, but let's go back to the Xiaomi IPO. I remember that in December 2014, Xiaomi announced it had raised over 1 billion at a 45 billion valuation. At that time, it was the highest-valued private tech company in the world and worth more than Uber. Yep, Xiaomi's rise was super rapid. But what we didn't mention was that Lei Jun was famous before Xiaomi. He had already had multiple successful startups under his belt, either as co-founder or major investor and chairman before founding Xiaomi. In fact, he was already actually a billionaire. Yeah, and that's why Xiaomi was able to raise 41 million at a 250 million valuation for its Series A, straight out of the gate. You know, there's so many mega fundraisers these days. We forget how big of a deal that was. In 2010, all of China only deployed 3.5 billion into VC, so Xiaomi's Series A was over one percent of the entire market for that year. And as Ray said, he was such a proven quantity; it wasn't that risky of a bet. So he's more like an Elon Musk, and this is his Tesla. Yeah, actually, that's closer to the truth than you think. Musk owns a bit over a quarter of Tesla. Lei Jun owns almost a third of Xiaomi. If Xiaomi goes public at a hundred billion dollars, 
Lightstream is going to be worth north of $30 billion, well above Robin Lee of Baidu and not far behind Jack and Ponyma of Alibaba and Tencent. Yeah, and even if Xiaomi goes public at the low end of the rumored valuation, it's going to make such a big splash in China tech. Right. Even more so than Alibaba, it's going to be a watershed moment for Chinese entrepreneurs. Because not only is Lei Jun a techie through and through, he finished his engineering degree in two years instead of four at China's top Wuhan University. He's made something that is globally competitive. Xiaomi hasn't solely relied on the massive domestic market of China. It's ventured beyond, and it's also not reliant on China's closed-off internet. While China is still over two-thirds of Xiaomi's revenues, India is growing fast. Anyway, I wonder what new heights enthusiasm for tech will surge to in China after Xiaomi goes public and does this massive IPO. I always feel like the market can't get any hotter, but I'm always wrong. So, what do you guys think? Let us know. Hey Yingying, what's the latest on Baidu? Right, so Baidu has a spinoff. It's called Du Xiaoman. Du is short for Baidu, and Xiaoman literally means small, full, and it's essentially Baidu bringing a bunch of PE firms into its FSG or financial services business. This bunch is led by TPG. Specifically, it's a 1.9 billion deal valuing the unit at 4 billion. Baidu keeps 38% of Du Xiaoman. TPG gets a bit over one quarter, and the other investors who collectively put in about 900 million dollars get the rest. These other investors include PE firm Carlyle Group and Beijing-based Taikong Insurance, so a corporation funding another corporate finance arm. It's expected to have something like half a billion dollars of revenue this year, and maybe be slightly profitable. Dude, aren't Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent always spinning off companies? In fact. That's one of my pet peeves when we look at capital raising data from China. It's riddled with what I would call fake fundraisings because they're really more like restructurings. Look at Alibaba's Ant Financial. Its Series A was valued at forty-five billion dollars. Series A. Anyway, okay. So back to spinoffs. They're happening with more and more frequency. Companies are taking fast-growing sectors and spinning them out to list them. JD.com, Tencent's e-commerce partner, spun out its financial services division about two years ago. Tencent itself is about to list its music unit for something like twenty-five billion dollars, and for Baidu, it just successfully listed its video streaming unit, ITE, which went public on the Nasdaq this past March for over two billion dollars. Maybe America invented Wall Street, but Chinese companies are no dummies when it comes to financial engineering and capital markets. Okay, okay. So that could well be true, but I like to think that Baidu is also making some pretty high-level strategic decisions here, ones that reflect on China's leadership in and future in AI. So Baidu has been one of the big companies most public about its commitment to AI and applying all of the loads of data it's got from search and other verticals to really enhance its ability to create meaningful applications. And as many of you know, at a national government level, China itself has long proclaimed its intention to become the world leader in AI. In all of these, China, with its massive amounts of mined data, will have the opportunity to really step it up now and find ways to apply this. And financial services is a big sector. I agree with you that the advancement of AI in China itself could just be a topic for an entire episode. Hey, in fact, we should do a review at one point of Kai Fu Li's new book on AI. It's coming out later this year, and is written in collaboration with our dear friend Matt Sheehan. Anyway, Baidu CEO Robin Li has called what they're creating an AI ecosystem. I'm a bit allergic to that phrase because it's hard to tell whether it's a spinoff to offload a big cost center or it's truly something proactive and strategic. The real question I want to know is, what does this actually mean for China's consumers? Alibaba and Tencent have had such a monopoly with Alipay and WeChat Pay. Baidu Wallet claims to have a hundred million users by the end of last year. So while that sounds like a lot, for comparison, WeChat has six hundred million, and Alipay is pretty close up as well. So it's got a long way to climb if it wants a larger piece of the pie. Yeah, we'll see if this ecosystem strategy works out for Baidu. Why does that remind me of the now defunct company La Echo? The internet video turned film, turned smartphone, turned smart car making company that just kept on growing and growing and growing until, well, I I think it just blew up. 
Hey, we should cover that someday, by the way. Do you think Kevin will let us? He used to work there. And so did you, Yingying, with their U.S. launch. Hmm. Should we thank Jia Yueting, the founder and CEO, for letting the finances get so far away from him? Because without his failure, Kevin and Lily wouldn't have struck out on their own, and we wouldn't have Pan Daily. Hey, are they going to edit this out? No, no, no. Kaiser and Carol, don't edit it out. Keep this in. Special thanks to our sponsor this week, the fabulous gaming company Zenjoy. They have this really awesome live trivia game called Cash Show, where you can win real money for answering questions correctly. I started playing this week and got to level 7 out of 10. Special thank you to Eric Wong, VP of International, and his team here at Zenjoy. To recap, this week we talked about Xiaomi's eminent IPO, as well as the spin-off of the financial services arm of Baidu. As always, you can find these and other stories we didn't get to cover on pandaily.com. Okay, that's all for this week, folks. Thanks for listening. We really enjoyed putting this together, as always, and are always open to any comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at ThePanDaily, T-H-E-P-A-N-D-A-I-L-Y, and my personal Twitter account is Rayma. That's spelled R-U-I-M-A. And my Twitter is spelled G-I-N-Y, G-I-N-Y. We'll be back here at the same time next week. Tech Best China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. Pandaily.com is a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Carol Yin and Kaiser Kuo. Special shout out to Dawei Chen who redid our theme music and made us that much cooler. And yes, you heard it right. He included a soundbite from Jack Ma as well as a line from the hottest Chinese hip hop group of the moment, Higher Brothers. If it sounded familiar, that's because it's from their hit song, Made in China, which played during the ending credits of Last Week's Silicon Valley and HBO. Go take a listen. Thanks, Dawei.